We'll be recording the meeting, and uh, I uh, also wanted to let you know that we'll probably uh, go for about 30 minutes on the lecture and then leave it open at the end to, um, to answer any questions and um, just to keep it more of an open dialogue. Now, uh, if you do have a question as we go along, you can put your question in the chat feature. I'll be monitoring that. Uh, we, we may not address that question right now, but then, uh, or, or as we go, but we'll see them and uh, I will uh, jump in if, if need be. So welcome everyone. One thing I'll ask right now is if you could make sure that your, uh, your microphones are muted and um, except all of you except for Ryan. And if Ryan could unmute himself, and then I'll go ahead and introduce Ryan now. Uh, take it away, Ryan. Hi, guys. So um, I was looking at some of the names coming in, and I realized a lot of you guys um, are probably uh, teams that I work with, which is cool because this is sort of a topic that um, I decided to do because of the conversations that we were actually having. So for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Ryan Vancher. I'm actually a co-founder of a company named Course Key, uh, and I'm currently the VP of Client Success. Uh, Course Key is a live online teaching and engagement platform, and we work with um, like vocational and trade schools, two years, four years. If you've been to SDSU, you've probably you know used us or heard of us. Um, and we work with schools all around the country at this point. Uh, we were started at SDSU in 2014 as a student company uh, that went through the Zip Launchpad, and today we're we're gradually approaching on becoming a $20 million company at this point uh, with about 20 to 25 employees right now. We just brought on a couple more heavy hitters. So uh, we're definitely in a growth phase right now, which, which has really been awesome. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I've been doing a lot of mentoring with teams in the rec center and, and at the zip launch pad. Um, and a common theme that I'm noticing is that teams, um, you, you can kind of tell them how to do entrepreneurship, but they have to really know what it looks like. And so I, I've got a lot of feedback that, you know, sometimes we might get caught up in the technical aspects of starting a company, but we don't really explore like the mental or emotional requirements that are required for long-term success in entrepreneurship. Um, and so I think sometimes stories can be just as powerful as strategies. And I wanted to share a little bit more about my story. Um, some of you guys may have heard it. I tried to make it a little more streamlined for the time, you know, of, the, of this, uh, this event. Um, but I'm a very non-traditional entrepreneur. So anybody on this call that's just not sure if you're going to start a business or if you want to start a business or if you can start a business, I was basically you. Um, and my hope is that by the end of this session, you guys will all realize that if somebody like me, you know, through my story is able to become what, you know, you might consider a you know, full-fledged entrepreneur, um, that you can too. So uh, when, I, when I got involved with student entrepreneurship, um, I was actually just bouncing off of what you guys might, you know, term rock bottom, um, but it wasn't for the first time. Um, so I want to kind of talk a little bit about where it all started. Uh, for me, um, going back to when I was 16 years old, um, I had a daughter really early when I was in high school. Uh, at that time, I was Chucky at Chuck E. Cheese, and I didn't really have a plan on going to college. Um, and I didn't really see too much of that where I grew up. I'm from San Bernardino, California. Um, and no one in my family ever really owned businesses either. So that wasn't really something that I thought I would do after school. Um, what I really thought I would do was probably be, you know, like a truck driver or something like that. Um, I had remembered I had an uncle Benny that I always heard make good money as a truck driver. And I thought, you know, if I can make 40 to $60,000 a year, that that would be, I, I would have made it basically. Um, and that's kind of where I was starting at. So with my daughter coming along, what I realized, I didn't know at the time, but you know, I, I, she, I ended up having a why, right. You know, kind of by accident, if you want to put it that way. Um, and so what I want you to think about during this story, cause she's going to pop up multiple times as my why behind some of the things that I've done. Um, and so I just want you to kind of think about through this story, if you're thinking about starting a business or if you're thinking about, you know, going after any goal, no matter what it is, um, just try to consider, you know, why would that be worth it? And so my daughter has always been that thing where whenever it's got tough, um, I've, I've always been able to kind of go back and, and when things didn't look like I thought they were supposed to look or, you know, things weren't going the way that I thought they should go. Um, I was able to go back and, and just kind of understand why I was doing what I was doing and why, why I needed to go through it. Um, so I'm going to come back to this later because it's going to become more clear what I mean by a why. Um, and I needed this why later when I ran into some of my obstacles. So it really started with Jazzy and that's her right there when she's about eight. Um, that was her when she was about five and today she's actually going, uh, just graduated high school and getting ready to go into college. So, um, those of you guys who are looking at me wondering, you know, how old is your daughter? She, uh, just turned 18. Um, so 
again, going back to 16, you guys can do the math, figure all that stuff out. But um, this was a big, big spark for me. So after that, um, what I ended up doing, because, you know, being Chucky didn't necessarily have a ton of upside, um, I decided to, jo to join the Army through what was called the Delayed Entry Program. And so when I was 17 and a half, with the help of my parents, Simon, some paperwork, um, I was able to start preparing to go into the Army right after high school. So when I graduated, I went to basic training. Um, I became what they call an 88 Mike. That's just like a, a transportation specialist. So I drove everything from Humvees to 18 wheelers. Um, and I spent some time as a recruiter too, when I got back from my job training, you know, before I got shipped around and deployed everywhere. Um, and so two key superpowers, and I, I'm gonna keep talking about superpowers during this, this, this um, webinar um, that I picked up that were very crucial to my success as an entrepreneur later were first discipline and the second one was perseverance, right? Um, and so while I was in the army, um, discipline was something that I, I never really had other than a pretty strict dad. Uh, my stepdad was a corrections officer. So, you know, I was up at seven o'clock on Saturdays cleaning and mowing the lawn, things like that. But I never really had to, had to kind of do it on my own. It was always like, here's your list, get it done. Um, and so when I first shipped out, you know, I had a, one of the hardest things that I dealt with was following these well-defined rules for everything. And so to graduate basic training, you have to go through some pretty intense stuff. There's, you know, the gas chamber, you wake up at 4 a.m., you're doing physical training like all day, plus all kinds of other training. Um, it, it's pretty intense, but they have a very well-defined structure and process for how they move everybody through the system. Um, so everything from the way you made your bed to how you folded, or in our case, rolled your clothes, uh, the time you woke up, the time you went to bed, when you took a shower, uh, how you address someone or ask the question, like it was all scripted. And so I slipped up a lot because I struggled with this. And as a result, I'd have to do like push-ups until my arms fell off, uh, flutter kicks till my legs didn't work. And then they'd make me get up and run until I couldn't do that, right? And so this was like a purely stick approach to motivating, you know, people, but it taught me the value of, you know, understanding stability and structure and appreciate the process behind things because it saved me a lot of pain once I started to understand that, you know, the bigger picture, there, were, there was a reason why these things were happening. So, so discipline was something I picked up in the military that I don't think I had, you know, very well before that. That was definitely a superpower that I brought to the table when I became an entrepreneur. Um, the second one in the military I mentioned is perseverance, right? This can only be learned one way. Um, and so the, the, the way that I, my first real big perseverance, you know, was uh, I got bit by a spider um, and it, it's a little more intense than you would think. But um, basically in my last weeks of basic training, I was bit on the inside of my thigh uh, by a brown recluse. I don't know if anybody knows what brown recluses are, but they, they can mess you up pretty bad because their venom kind of deteriorates the skin a little bit. And so uh, mine ended up getting infected before I caught it and I had to go to the hospital to take care of it. And so this was during what we called like an FTX. So it's a field training exercise and it's this last test before graduation. So like you have to pass this to graduate. Um, and it basically FTX is like you go for like a week long trek into some simulated environment. Uh, in my case, it was, you know, the woods because I was in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Um, and we would do cool stuff like, you know, high tech laser tag, urban warfare training, we would do like sleep deprivation training where you stay up long periods of time, um, just all kinds of stuff basically to, to get you ready. And one of the last things that you do is the 10K march back where you're in your full ruck, but it's in the dead of night. And I was in Missouri in the woods in the middle of winter. So it was like ridiculously cold. You know, you haven't been sleeping much. Um, you've been drilling like your life depending on it. Uh, and I ended up getting sent to the hospital like 24 hours before this hike to deal with this bite in my leg. And so... Uh, the next morning, my drill instructor showed, showed up and he goes, you know, hey, if you can't make this, this, uh, this ruck, you're going to get rolled over, meaning I would have to start over again and wait eight weeks until the next nine week class started and do that week over again in order to graduate. And so as soon as he told me that, I mean, I, I basically got up, uh, I, I jumped in the back of the truck uh, uh, and I, we drove all the way back out there and I, I was sick as hell and I had a fever, everything going on and I marched literally in the cold. Uh, temperature in the middle of the night for a 10k fully racked up um, and, and our drill sergeant never really said much in like the area of like encouragement or kudos along our you know relationship but that was the first time where, where they you know they, they looked at me and, and kind of said like you know good good job you know and it was the first time that I realized um, you know, I, I could do anything if I just kept walking right and if I just persevered 
And so discipline and perseverance were, were big parts of what I took from the military that I think everybody needs if you're planning on trying to start a company. Now, later when I was kind of deployed in different places, I started reading a lot of books when I was bored. And, and one of them I found talked about door-to-door -door sales. And so it said, if you did you know, one, one year of door-to-door -door sales where you just went around and knocked on people's doors and sold them stuff, you could get the equivalent of a four-year communications degree. Uh, and so after I wrapped up, you know, my, my enlistment term, I did a little bit of recruiting. And so then I decided I was going to try this out. And I realized I had another superpower that came very natural to me and it was sales. Right. And so um, one of my sales mentors actually kind of put this idea in my head that, you know, I used to think sales was like this slick, you know, side handed used car dealer kind of thing where it was all, you know, uh, you know a little shady. Right. Uh, and then what I realized was like sales was like a profession, right? And there's shady lawyers and there's amazing lawyers. And the lawyers that are amazing typically have law books in their office. They're well-educated. They, they spent the 10,000 hours trying to learn that craft. Um, and, and he told me, you know, the only time you'll be an excellent salesperson is if you put in that 10,000 hours. And so I read books. I went to, to conferences. I went to webinars. And, and I basically became a trainer um, because I got really good going around the country, knocking on people's doors and selling them stuff. And uh, one of the things that I learned, you know, as at, through that process was that if I treated, you know, my profession, just like any other profession, that's well respected, like doctors or lawyers or anybody, if I took it that serious, I could be the best at what I was doing. And so I had this idea that, you know, it, it the 10,000 hour rule applies, but we all have to master our crafts. And so one of the things, you know, not just at sales, but anything. So like now, you know, I, I look at client success as the VP of client success. So I don't need to master sales. I need to master retention and advocacy. And so I'm constantly thinking what craft is going to be required for my business at this point. Uh, and I sold everything, you know, from telecommunications, insurance, cell phones, multi-level marketing stuff, like you name it, I've sold it. Um, and what I ended up eventually realizing was like my talent can take me fairly far, but a lack of education created these ceilings everywhere I went because all my bosses had degrees and everybody had an education. Uh, and so for whatever reason, even though I, I excelled at, you know, everything below that level without that dot or that bullet on my resume that said I was educated as well, there was just no position for me to move up. And so that kind of led me to wanting to go back to school. Now, before that happened, I ran into a little, another speed bump, or you can call it another rock bottom, so to speak. Um, so when I decided to go back to school, I had a little money saved up from the military and, and some of my sales work and stuff like that. And I knew I wasn't going to be working as much. So I decided I want to try to make some side income. Um, and so it was like at the start of 2009, you know, I, I talked with one of my friends who I grew up with, um, decided we would throw some money together and start a weed business. Um, now, this was back before, you know, legalization and the medical marijuana laws were like fairly new and the industry was definitely not as popular as it was today. Um, but to make a long story short, put myself in a bad situation, cops kick at my door and take everything I've got, cash, everything, like literally everything that I had that I put into it was gone like immediately within about, you know, I'd say eight months um, was the time it took to put the money into the time where I lost it all. Um, during this process, I had to take a plea deal so I could stay out of jail because I was just getting ready to start school like my first semester in college. Um, and because I had already quit my job because I wanted to go back to school and do this side of income, I got in this situation where I now had a felony. And when I went back to go to work, nobody would hire me. Um, and I'd never had this problem before. Um, and so I spent a lot, you know, quite a bit of eight months of a year picking up trash at a national park every Saturday and Sunday from 6am for, you know, for just ridiculous amounts of time. Uh, and it was one of the lowest, lowest points of my life. Like I lost everything. Uh, including like my self-respect. I had to move back from my house. I had to move back in with my parents at like, you know, 24 years old. It was just a bad, bad look. Um, and so one of the things that I learned from this and you'll kind of see there is the, the, the concept of ownership. And so I, I remember in my interview, my probation officer, um, it was, there were some things she said in the way that she treated me in that, that interview that, lit this spark in me because she didn't she didn't listen to anything I said and she just assumed the worst in me nobody cared like she didn't care that I was in the military and served in the army she didn't care if I was great at sales she didn't care that I was planning on going back to school and, and she literally told me to my face in that interview like you're now and always will be a felon like it's not a game this is for life and I remember like I, I had a flash of this judge telling me like if you ever want to see your daughter again I better never see you in this courtroom like she knew I was going to be back 
And then right away, like when I had talked about my daughter as my why, like that remembering the judge saying that they would take it away my why activated it. And then my discipline and perseverance superpowers came in really handy because getting through the probation system or, or, or you know, the, the correction system is not easy. It's, it's just as hard as the military in terms of everything that you have to do right in order to make it out. And so luckily I had developed the superpower of discipline, meaning I can do exactly what you told me to do when you told me to do it and perseverance, right? I can get up every Saturday and Sunday at 6 PM and go pick up horseshit at a farm and trash from a lake uh, because I took ownership of this is what I needed to do. And so I, I knew like, you know what, like nobody has the right to tell me who I am and what I can be. And I decided I was going to become the poster boy for what somebody should be in a probation program and did exactly everything that they required of me. So I never missed check-ins. I, I attended every Narcotics Anonymous session they made me take. I never missed a weekend at that, that job you know, program. Um, and I also found a job, you know, selling somebody hired me because I went in and I said, look, you put me on the floor for two weeks, commission only, I'll compete against all the reps you got in the store. And if I come out on top, you have to offer me a job. And so my sales skills came in handy that I had developed before because I had mastered that skill and I had, I had proven to somebody that I, I could bring enough value to their company to offset what they thought about my resume or, or my criminal record. Um, and so through, through ownership, now I had the combination of, you know, my why I had my, my sales kind of, you know, uh, master, you know, mastery. I had discipline, I had perseverance, and now I was taking ownership, right? And ownership is just another fundamental requirement of being an entrepreneur. You have to be willing to take ownership. Um, and so after this part of the story, you know, this kind of brings me into, um, you know, what I would consider going up in, in terms of like, if, if my life was a stock, I was on the upswing, Right. Um, and so this brings me through like my two year journey, right? So while I was on probation and while I was trying to work, um, I ended up getting an associate's degree, right? And I, I got a grade point average that was good enough to get into four schools. One was in New York, three were in California. I wanted to go to the one in New York, but my probation didn't let me leave the state. So I had to choose a California school um, and SDSU was what I selected. And I had no idea about entrepreneurship or zip launch pads or anything. I just knew the IB program, international business, required you to study abroad. And I wanted to do that. And I chose Latin America so I could go to Costa Rica. That was pretty much my big picture for school. Um, now, ha also having a daughter while I was young, you know, she was growing up and she was getting into like, you know, middle school, stuff like that. And she started to get grades, right? And so she, I realized like she's competing with me. She sees me being proud of being a good student and celebrating my success. And my daughter started kind of like, you know, earning her own, own ribbons and celebrating her own successes. And I realized like something was happening um, with what I was doing that was changing the way other people thought about themselves and what they can do. And so we would compete on like recently, you know, she sends me straight A report cards and she's like, yo, you know, here's my straight A's. And she loves earning awards and ribbons and, and you know, pushing herself. And so what I, what I realized was I was creating like this legacy. Because I don't know that before, and, and this isn't like a knock on my family, I just don't know, but I don't know that we place the high value on like formal education. We're always street smart, we're always hard workers, but we typically, I don't think, could afford four-year university or college. So we made it up with like hard work, right? Hustle. Um, and then I've got my associate's degree, I went on to SDSU and got my bachelor's, and so now it's not even a question of whether my daughter wants to go to school or not. Like, she's got her own plans, her own goals. She's signing up for a community college next year because she wants to save money there before and, and learn what she wants to do before she commits to a school. So she, she's basically taken on like this, this paradigm shift that like, that this is what we do. We go to school now. I've seen, you know, my family, my, my sisters are going back to school. My youngest sister graduated. My oldest sister's taking classes now. And this is like who we are. And so sometimes they just have to see somebody do it. And so one of the, one of my favorite stories about like, you know, Sometimes you just have to show people that it can be done before they believe they can do it themselves. And the four minute mile story with Roger Bannister is like one of my favorites. Um, and if you don't know Roger Bannister, I mean, you know what a four minute mile is, but prior to 1954, like nobody thought it was possible for anybody to run a mile within four minutes because they thought the body just couldn't take it. It would give down, you would collapse or die, whatever. Um, and so Roger Bannister did it in 1954. 
Now, the cool thing about the story isn't that he did it. It's that 46 days later after that, after nobody believed they can do it, his record was broken just 46 days. And then since then, literally thousands of people from men, women, and children have all ran four minute miles. And it just took somebody to do it first so that everybody else knew it can be done. And so I wanted to build a legacy for my family of taking ownership. I wanted to have a legacy of mastering our crafts. I wanted a legacy of being disciplined and, and persevering. And so, so those things kind of help me for this next part of the story. And this is where my stock kind of starts to, to rock bottom on me again. Um, it was when I got to SDSU. So when I got down here, I was in the deserts for, I don't know how long between where I was stationed, um, where I lived, you know, up in, in Victorville in the Barstow area. Um, and I just wanted to get out. And so I finally made it to SDSU at the beaches. Um, and I got down here and I, I, I literally felt like I had just fought for my life to get to this place. And like I had just created a new one and there was no way I was going back. And so June of 2012, I move in just got off probation, things are looking up. And then as far as I was concerned, I made it, we were good. Uh, and then within a few weeks, I, I, you know, I literally a few weeks, I was in the emergency room at the hospital down the street from my house. And I was waking up to receive some like rock bottom news. So right after I moved in, I started getting really weird symptoms. I started getting sick, like things were smelling weird. I had this weird like pressure in my neck. Like if somebody was just not choking me, but had their hand like this all the time. Um, like when I would go to sleep, I couldn't bend my neck a certain way without getting out of breath. I would sweat at night. Um, and eventually I started having like veins popping up in my chest and all over my body. Um, and it turned out that I ended up having, when, when I went to try to get somebody to, to look at me, when I was doing my intake portion, I started hyperventilating and I like blacked out. And so I woke up in the emergency room and they basically told me um, I, need, I needed to do something called a biopsy where they pull out a piece of this thing that they saw in a chest x-ray and that they needed to figure out what it was. And it turned out to be a tumor. It was the size of a grapefruit and it was pushing against my lungs. And so I wasn't getting nearly enough oxygen, which is why these veins started to show up. Uh, and I had a cancer that was called T-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and so the, the treatment for something like this, because it's a rapid growing cancer, the treatment was something that was, that was pretty aggressive and rapid itself. Um, and luckily, you know, I was healthy. I was in the military for a while. Um, I was in the gym for a few years before this happened too. So I was, I was pretty fit and young. Um, and so they offered me a treatment that's a lot more aggressive and they don't really, like they wouldn't give it to elderly people just because their bodies couldn't take it. But they said, this has the best chance of success. You know, if you do this and you do all of it, you know, eight treatments straight, you know, you, you'll have a 30% chance to beat this thing based on where they caught it. Um, and so I remember thinking like when they told me that I was just like, are you like, really? Like I, I made it all the way here and like, this is how it's going to play out. Um, and I was devastated, like, not just because somebody told me I had, you know, cancer, but it, it was like, I also like was hit with this immediate feeling of like, what did I not accomplish? Like, I'm here to graduate. Like I'm trying to get this four year degree. Like that was jeopardized. Um, and then like, I, I had this big kind of like, why me feeling come over me and I just broke down crying. And then my mom got down there and my mom's in the medical field. And so my mom did something where she, she told me something that was kind of terrible to say to somebody <laughs> and it, you'll get what I mean by when I say that, but it was also something that made my mindset shift to where I thought about things a little bit different. And so my mom's worked in the medical field, medical field forever, um, like, you know, family offices, things like that. And so statistically speaking, she's always known that one out of four people in the U S get cancer, right? Now I have three siblings, so there's four of us. So she's always known statistically, one of her kids will probably get cancer. Um, now she told me when she came in, like we were kind of talking and she said, you know, I've always known that one of you guys might get it. And she said, I always hoped that it would be you. And I remember when she told me that, I was kind of like, what, you, what? Um, and then, but what I ended up realizing, you know, and she kind of explained it to me was that as I grew up, like I was always the, the first one that you know, got the job first. I got my license first. I always protected my brothers and sisters. You know, when I, when we would go to the grocery store as kids, like I would be the one that would like to pay, you know, and I just, she's just always thought that if anybody had a chance to do it, that I would have the best chance to do it. And so she, she flipped this little switch in me where I basically stopped at, you know, this why me thing where, where it was like, why not me? Right. Um, 30% chance to live, you know, they're telling me to drop out of school because I'll jeopardize my academic standing. And if my grades dip down, I might lose like some scholarships. And so we, I just decided like, you know, why, why, if there's anybody that, that should go through this or could go through this, 
why wouldn't it be me? Right. Cause I don't want this to happen to my brothers and sisters. Um, and then when she told me that I, I, I also knew like, this is my mom being strong for her kid. And so I immediately remembered again, my why. And I'm like, if my mom can come in here and talk like this, when she, I just told her, I have a 30% chance not to make it. And she's, she's literally telling me all the reasons why I can, like, I've got to be just as strong for my why, because I knew at that moment I was hers. Right. And so I knew that chemo was going to take discipline and perseverance because they said you have to take eight, eight sessions in a row and you cannot miss one because every time you miss the, the resistance to the drug will likely go up. And if you keep taking breaks in between because it gets too hard, the likelihood of that 30%, it's going to go down and it's going to become less effective each time you decide to take a break. Now, when I say eight sessions, I'm going to describe what this is so that you guys know what I committed to. Eight sessions means we're going to take you into the hospital about 10 days of every month. For the first few days, we're going to basically lay you down. We're going to stick a needle in your spine and pull out spinal fluid. Then we're going to replace it with chemo drugs. Then you have to lay down flat on your back. And if you move at all, which you have to because you're nauseous and throw up, you get these migraines where it feels like somebody's just smacking you in the head with a baseball bat. I'm not, a, this is literally what it felt like. Um, you feel like there's a fire burn, like a sunburn underneath your skin, like on your bones that you just can't get to. Like your, your, your knees feel swollen, your elbows feel swollen. And I signed up for this to do this eight times in a row while I was going through school full time in the international business program at SDSU, which was ranked number 11 in the country, right? So everything's on the line, but I did not miss a session. I, I did every single session. I did not miss it. The same way I got through the military with discipline and perseverance, the same way I got through probation by, by doing every single thing that they asked of me that, that I thought would help me achieve success was the same way that I approached this, except now I had a mindset shift. I remember what my why was. And I knew that if I had discipline, perseverance, and I mastered my craft, this time as just being a student, that I would be able to get through this. And, and my GPA went up during the time I was doing chemotherapy full-time as a student in my undergrad, um, going to SDSU, right? And so now I felt like I was Captain Planet, right? And, and I had my why, I had a mindset, I had perseverance, discipline, mastering craft. And I just felt like I have all these superpowers now that I just never knew I can have. And they all came as a result of having to bounce off rock bottom, right? And then now I stumbled into entrepreneurship right after I started getting healthy. And that's when this course key thing started, right? So what I, what I want you guys to really understand is like, it doesn't matter where you start. Uh, what matters is how you react to what happens along the way. And, and that determines where you finish. Now on this slide, I have something called studentpreneur because there was a transition for me of going from a student to a full-fledged entrepreneur. And while I was at SDSU, I didn't make that transition until after I left but I had a lot of skill sets at this point that I can use to really make a go at starting a business with other like-minded people, right? So when I got into entrepreneurship, I actually started researching it first. Uh, when I was sick in the hospital, I get all these emails about cool stuff students can do. And my, again, I was trying to focus on my education. I didn't want to worry about my health. I wanted the doctors to do that. You tell me what to do, I'm going to do it, but I'm not thinking about it more than checking that box. And so I started just really going in on trying to find opportunities to get involved. So there was two things that I did. I started joining entrepreneur, like student organizations like the Entrepreneurship Society, partly because I wanted the t-shirt that they gave you from Volcom with it. But, you know, the other reason was because I thought, you know, hey, maybe I can put this on my resume as well. And I found a research program and they said, we want you to research teams in this center, which is how I found the Zip Launchpad that are, you know, trying to start building these businesses from ideas. And we want to research how the, how the teams form together and people come together with their own superpowers um, and build a business. And so I thought that was a great, you know, thing to focus my time on and a great thing to put on my resume. So I started doing that. And then eventually they ended up sending me to a conference. Um, and in the conference, I saw other students present. And like right before I went, the team I was researching, like most startups failed, like their team disbanded, students graduated, you know, things happened and the team just didn't make it. Um, so I went to this conference to see other students present. And I realized right away, I was like, I do not want to do this. Like, I do not want to present research. Like I, I became so fascinated with seeing these guys having superpowers. And, you know, like I, I always kind of tell the story of this guy who had the title SEO specialist, like search engine optimization to me is just a term now. But back then when I didn't know what it meant, I thought that guy might've been, you know, a superhero. I'm like, what the hell is an SEO specialist, you know? And so those were things where I was just fascinated by people like, okay, there's masters of their crafts over here. And 
I wanted to do entrepreneurship and I stopped doing my research. I didn't want to find a new company. And I made a goal that said, if I want, if I want to find a way into the Zon Center before the next application period, which was six months. And it just so happened, I joined that entrepreneurship society. And like within a week of me putting that as a goal, Luke, my co-founder and the CEO of our company, um, he posted in the entrepreneur society on Facebook saying he got in and he just needed help building his, his company. And so I got to go meet him starting with, you know, having a strong why. I was, I brought discipline. I brought perseverance. I, I'm the guy who runs through walls at my company. Um, I have a commitment to self-improvement and, and mastery of my craft, which is a part of our culture. Like it's in our DNA. There's nobody at my company that's not committed to self-improvement. Uh, the ability to take ownership, right? We don't have anybody who scapegoats anyone. Everybody in a startup matters, right? Um, the vision of changing a legacy. Like we have so many stories and course of people, you know, coming from other countries and building enough, you know, income to, bring their families over and help them get citizenship and send money back home, you know, and just do things that just nobody ever thought was possible. And then a why saw a mindset of like, why not me? Like, why don't we go to school? Why don't we go to college? Why don't we start businesses? Why don't my kids get to do, you know, what these other kids did when I, when I, you know, was in my neighborhood seeing people with nice stuff, you know? And so there, there is this perfect storm of these superpowers, you know, that, that you need for weathering the storm of entrepreneurship or, you know, in my case, the storms of life, um, and one thing I've learned, you know, I, I have a mentor named Eric Thomas, and he he's always talks about, you know, you're you're either going into a storm, you're you're heading, you like you're heading to the storm, you're either in the storm, like actually in it, or you're coming out of it. And if you've been paying attention to my story, it's literally heading into storms, being in the storms, and coming out of storms. And that's exactly what entrepreneurship is like. And so I'm I'm the first real business owner in my family now, but I've seen other family members start businesses since then. You know, I, I was creating jobs before I graduated college as an undergrad. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still building my dream and working on my own asset while paying myself for the value that I bring to the company and to the market. Um, and, and at this point, you have to be thinking like, well, sh shit, what's my excuse, right? Um, so just to kind of wrap this up, one, one of my favorite motivational speakers or even personal development guys, you know, from a long time ago was Jim Rohn. Now he's not around anymore, but I remember him. There was, there was a speech that he did where um, he would ask his audience, you know, he would leave them with four questions at the end. And one of the, the, the time I watched that and heard it, I wrote those questions down on a mirror that I had because I just wanted to keep asking myself those. And so I want to leave you with those same questions. Um, and, you know, you guys have heard kind of my story where, you know, I, I started from the, the opposite of what you would expect somebody who's, you know, maybe is considered the prototype entrepreneur, you know, what you might consider. Um, and so these are some of the questions I want you guys to kind of ask yourselves. So the first question is obviously why, right? I already told you you have to have a why. And I don't mean why as in like, what's your why? I mean like, why, why, why would I work as hard as I did, right? Why should you work it that hard? Why, why should you take that many classes or attend that many webinars or, or sit in, in things like this? And why should you be taking notes on what I'm talking about and reading the books that somebody mentions and, you know, spend years working on your education uh, you know, it might, why put yourself through discomfort and, and risk failure and, you know, try a startup when you could go back to work and provide for your family. Right. And so the best answer Jim Rohn would say is, is the second question. And it's the same one that my mom posed to me. Why not? Right. You know, wh why not? It, why not go see how many books you can read or, or how many classes you can take or how many different skills you can master or what, what value you can bring to your family and your friends and your business and the school or your, your organizations, whatever it is. And, and why not see what you can make of yourself or how far you can go? Like, why not do that? And then the third question he always poses is why not you, right? So everybody on this conversation and in, in this webinar right now, like, why don't you develop a great self-esteem and why don't you prove everybody wrong that told you you were going to be something? And why don't you, you know, start mastering your craft today and, and create a legacy for your family and make progress towards building the business that like you see in your head uh, because obviously if, if I can do it, you know, that, you know, that saying you can do it too. Right. So I'm personally asking you, why not you, if, if you've got the brains, you've got the will, you've got the potential, why don't you tell your story the way that I am in a few years? And then the last question is obviously the most important question. Why not now? Right. I had a 30% chance to live and I had to think very hard about after I had my second chance, like there, there's no time like now to work on your goals, to set yourself up for like the better future to check things off your bucket list that you've been waiting to do until someday, because some days they say is not on any calendar. Like you'll never find Sunday anywhere. 
And, and I was in, I was honestly embarrassed by all the stuff that I never did uh, when I was laying there wondering if I was going to die or not. Like, I just remember how much shit I talked to everybody about what I was going to do and how big I was going to be. And I did maybe 10% of it. I just never took the first steps. And so, you know, what, what a good time for you guys to get your shit together, right. And for, for you to grow and to change and, and develop, develop yourself and, um, you know, be able to, to tell a story that, you know, hopefully today, you know, maybe there's a handful of you guys that are like, holy guy, holy cow, this guy is nothing. Like if literally, if he can do this, I know I can do this. And that's not a knock on me. That's just that, that's just something that you have to realize that this, this is within everybody. Um, so again, this is a very, uh, more, you know, high level, maybe like philosophical type of approach to a workshop. But I think you guys are going to get more than enough technical and, and sometimes stuff like this really helps create vision and, and starts helping you guys think about motivation as well. Um, and so I, I always tell, you know, some of the teams I've been mentoring, I've been telling them, you know, philosophy, you know, for your business is like your culture and, and philosophy is the, like the way that a boat sets its sail, right? When, right now we've talked about COVID and, you know, how, how companies are responding and whether they're going under or thriving, and the, the ones that are thriving, we're, we're doing things in advance to be ready for this situation. And, and we as a company, we're setting our sale years ago. So our philosophies are clear, you know, we, we're problem solvers, we're curious, you know, we, we, we are accountable, we're self motivated. And so that translates to whether we're in an office or at home. And so, you know, that, that saying, it, it, the same winds blow on us all. And it's not how, you know, the, the wind blows, it's how you set the sail that determines if you get to your destination or not. And so these things like discipline and perseverance and mindset, having a why, those, that's your sale. So that no matter what hits you or the way the wind blows or, or what, you know, hurricane comes in and knocks you off your path, your, your sale's set to get you back on track. And, and I don't wish cancer or felonies or kids at 16 or anything that I've talked about on anybody. And I feel like everybody should be able to learn from other people's experiences. But, you know, sometimes you do have to hit a rock bottom to figure out what your superpower is. Um, hopefully these questions will help you guys kind of maybe start thinking about your own and, and, you know, avoid having to go down that path. But, but sometimes this is what it takes to, to actually become an entrepreneur. So um, that's all I got. I hope you guys, you know, find value in that. Um, if you guys want to reach out to me or anything or have any questions, um, you can find me on, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, everything's at Ryan Vancher. And then uh, now Tanya, if there's any questions or anything that, um, you see that you want to kind of moderate for us, we'll go ahead and open it up. Thank you so much. First of all, Ryan, I just, uh, I, I love hearing your, your story and it motivates me. It makes me feel like anything's possible. I know uh, sometimes when I'm feeling a little bit sorry for myself, I think about um, the fact that you say yes to everything. You, you, you did everything uh, with a 30% chance to live and uh, it's so inspiring. I just, um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Amazing. So um, let's open it up for uh, comments, questions uh, f from the from the audience. Uh, whatever you have, uh, let, let us know. Do you, uh, you can either unmute yourself if you want to ask Ryan directly, or if you prefer to put it in the chat, I'd be happy to uh, pass that question along um, to Ryan from there. Okay, so I see a lot of thank yous um, for, uh, thank you for sharing and how fantastic it was, great presentation, inspirational, thank you. And a lot of thank yous from everybody. Does anybody have any specific questions uh, for Ryan? Now, uh, he, he has uh, amazing, you know, amazing insight, insight to share. So if you do have even any specific questions about your, um, your business idea, your business model, he, He's a mentor for us um, at the REC, and he's been helping the student teams one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, develop their business models and um, and really move forward with that. So I'm seeing just a lot of comments from everybody. Any, uh, I got a quick question for Ryan, if possible. And who's this? Can you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Xavier Rodriguez. Um, I'm currently in your class right now for, uh, when you're in Miramar. Hi, Xavier. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so Ryan, uh, great story, uh, a phenomenal story. I do know, know Mark Barron. He does mentor me uh, oh, uh, nice. in my startup. So it's, it's, I've, been to your, <laughs> yeah, I've been to your facility over at, uh, uh, right here by um, uh, Washington Street. <clears throat> so uh, uh, a beautiful facility as well. But a uh, quick question is most, more in, I'm sure with this uh, uh, transition that, that's going on now, uh, um, how do you 
how do you, uh, you know, with, I'm sure the volume was incredible, um, you know, of requests for your services. Um, how do you deal with that volume if there was any volume in an uptick of it? And uh, um, like, you know, so many requests I'm sure were from many places around the nation. Uh, you know, how, how do you guys deal with that? So I think part of that is, is like the foundation of our business, right? So we, we spent a lot of time um, building different components of the business that we know are needed to scale. And we, we were, we've been doing it the whole time, right? So one of the, one of these stories I've read recently that, that can kind of illustrate this is in, in San Francisco, there's this building that's like massive. It's called like the millennial towers. And they're finding out now that on the millennial towers, like, they didn't dig deep enough in terms of the foundation in order to um, kind of create the structure that would be required to hold that building up. And then um, that somebody dropped a marble, you know, and it kind of rolled and they were like, what the heck, that's not supposed to happen. And it turns out it's going to cost millions of dollars because this building was kind of built on sand. Um, the same thing would have been true of our company if we were not building systems, processes, and, and, and scalable, you know, approaches to how we do our business so that, in the event that luck strikes and, and your business, like our business has doubled in the last, you know, eight weeks, I think. And so in the event that that strikes, you have to be ready for it. Otherwise you miss the opportunity. And so luckily for us, we had been putting a lot of time, resources, hiring smarter people than us to build out these new processes and systems so that when this, when this hit, it wasn't like we got caught off guard. If anything, we just needed to adjust a little bit. And so we, we spent a lot of time really, you know, from the culture all the way up to every, every layer of our, our business, making sure the foundation was solid and that if something did happen, we were in a position to capitalize. Um, and I think that's, you know, somebody had asked, uh, you know, what's my favorite course key moment so far? And honestly, I'm living it right now. Like I've never seen the type of business we're getting now and the growth that we're getting and the amount of leads we're getting and the appreciation for what we do and the new market fit that we have. Um, and so this is just one of those crises where we, you know, we almost thought we were going to lose our business because we all did on ground attendance. And, and now we have a new market opened up with this online education that everybody had to move to. And we were in a position where our foundation was solid enough to where when the building shook, we were kind of still able to stand. I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Awesome. And um, I see some, uh, some questions from the audience about book recommendations. Oh, um, so I mean, it, it depends on, you know, again, there's technical books, there's, you know, um, sort of philosophy or setting sale books. Um, one that I've, I've really appreciated recently was um, Infinite Games by Simon Sinek. Um, it, it's, I talk about this probably every chance I get, but it's really a philosophy of whether you're playing a finite game or, or an infinite game. Um, and finite games are, you know, like sports, you know, football might be coming back soon. So there's quarters, beginnings, and scores. Everybody plays to win. You know, some people play for fun. Nobody plays to lose. But there's rules to the game, and there's a start and an end. And when it's over, it's over until you start the next game again. Um, some people approach business like that. You know, I, I made the mistake of approaching marriage like that at one point. And what, you, what I realized with that book is there's another philosophy called infinite games, where the game is always being played, and the only difference is whether or not, you know, the players change. But, like, you know, education technology is always happening and whether course key is in that market or not in that market determines how long we play the game. And so we have a mindset now of we're an infinite game company. We're, we're in this for the long haul. Uh, we don't have, you know, whereas before I might've thought at the end of the Zon center six month program, course key is going to be complete. That I kind of started with that finite mindset. And so this is one book that if you're an entrepreneur, like this is a lifelong process and it's an infinite game. You can, you can play at different times. You can jump in and you jump out, but entrepreneurship is always going to be entrepreneurship. And, and you've just got to understand that there's no start or stop to it. It's, it's, that's why I, I tell you guys, lifelong learning is just a key component of what we do. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I see a, a question from Paula, who was asking uh, about pivot points, um, particularly pivot points or interactions or innovations that you've um, made because of coronavirus or post yeah so, so i mean we had to we had to switch it within about two weeks if you looked at course key before coronavirus hit course key was a brick and mortar on ground in the classroom attendance technology that schools used to make sure students were within four walls 
Um, we had some other features that are used in different markets and stuff like that, but primarily that's what we did. If you looked at how we branded and represented ourselves, as soon as this hit 100% of our business was at risk, right? And so we had to, as a company pivot, we had to kind of get together and we had to think, okay, who does our business need to become to match what the market requires today? And so part of that was adjusting what we, what we represented as a brand on the, on the internet and the, the way that we went about doing business. So prior to this, we had to go to conferences and make face-to-face -face connections to create leads. And then we'd work those leads and sell them throughout the year. But there was a conference season, there was a sales season. And that was pretty much how it went. Now Luke had brought in just so much talent from, you know, marketing automation and sales ops where all of our leads are coming in from online, from Facebook, from Google ads, from, you know, basically all these new sort of sales marketing 2.0 places where we never had that opportunity before because we didn't think the market would do it. Now we found out we have, you know, when, when everything goes back to normal, we're still going to go back to the conferences and we're still going to do that business, but we've doubled our business within the last eight weeks by switching to this new model um, and allowing people to find us and kind of pull them in versus us have to go push a sale on them somewhere else. Um, our, our website now, if you go look at it, says live online, uh, you know, attendance and engagement platform. We're all about making your online Zoom sessions like this feel more like a class. So we're using a lot more of our platform with these new clients. Um, and so we're, we're building a lot more on the engagement side than we used to because that's what the market needed. Turns out that's opening up new opportunities and partnerships. So um, out of every crisis, I mean, it's kind of a tough saying, but out of every crisis, there's an opportunity. And if, if your company is built on, on these, you know, kind of disciplines and, and poly, these things that I just kind of laid out here, if that's a part of your company DNA, you get through something like this when the market says, hey, your business model that you built the last four years isn't going to work. And it took us two weeks to adjust. And now our, our, you know, that we've doubled the number of clients that we have literally in eight weeks. And it's, it's just something where, you know, I would never have guessed the, the biggest crisis that we face would be the biggest opportunity we get. But it's just, that's the, the common theme that I see in my life where I think like, oh my God, I spent all this time on a business and now we got to reevaluate what we're doing. And if we can even move forward to finding out we're going to double our market cap and, and double our clients along, you know, this process. And when things go back to normal, we'll see what we do. But for right now, you know, we've, we've definitely bounced off of, you know, the initial impact of this thing. Wow. That's amazing. I had no idea. I had no idea. Uh, yeah. It just goes to show. Just goes to show. Uh, I have a, a, I know we're almost out of time, but there's a couple more questions. Um, uh, a lot of questions about, um, procedural logistics um what are the kind of things that you did um right away uh, one of the you know some of the first things you did once you um decided that you were going to launch a course key and um you know how long did it take and those sort of uh, logistic questions about about that if you could maybe speak a little bit about that the early days of course key yeah well and when i when i talk with the teams like all the teams i'm talking to now there's a like a spectrum right between some who are a little further along and some who are just like i got an idea i kind of think this i'm trying to figure out where to go next and so if you're on that side of the spectrum i usually start with you know and kind of what, what your program does at the rec you know what we do with these students is you know kind of validate that idea before you go all in and spend a bunch of resources and you know, start buying websites and, and all this kind of stuff. Like there's some stuff that you should probably do a little upfront research just to make sure that, that you kind of know what you're getting into. And so um, one thing I suggest is put up a curtain and make it look like a business, but don't invest in it as if it is a business, right? You don't need to start buying all kinds of software and stuff. If you have no way to, you know, if you're just going to put it all on credit cards, don't do it. Like the, these programs and these resources like the rec center and the zip launch pad, we built a business. Our, our first alpha came up to 1200 bucks. And I always say a bunch of spicy chicken sandwiches on Sundays. That's basically how we built the very first version of course key $1,200, right? So you don't need much, but we built it knowing that this is the minimum viable, you know, investment we can make into our product to get our MVP. And we're also out there validating with surveys, interviews, and things that we really encourage you guys to do to make sure that, you know, when we did have an alpha and we spent the $1,200, at least there was a use case and a chance for success where we could use it, right? Because nobody wants to build something nobody's going to, going to use. So we, we did it our best to look like a business so that if we talked to you and communicated with you and you look for us, we showed up. But we didn't go all in on, on the business early because we just didn't know anything. And so, you know, you guys, you know, probably don't know this, but we stopped selling to higher ed, you know, instructors where students have to pay for the platform. 
The only people that use us now are people who come to us and want to use us, but we don't actually have sales reps anymore who go knock on doors like I used to do and sell instructors. Uh, we, we've kind of switched our business model and take a completely different approach where we're doing one to three year contracts where the school pays for it and the students get it for free. So um, those are types of things where, you know, you start with little pivots early on, but by developing that nimbleness, and I think somebody mentioned flexibility in the comments, it allows you to kind of keep that as, as an agile business so that you can move when you learn things that can either really accelerate your growth or in some cases, like I had to fire half all of my team, which was half the company one time, because after a while we learned what we couldn't do, which was, you know, continue on a track that we were because it would be way too expensive and there was too much competition. And so sometimes you learn things after the fact and sometimes, you know, you can kind of get ahead of them. But that, that agile, nimble approach to being able to pivot your business and, um, you know, starting with just looking like, you know, a business and then not going too far down in case you need to rebrand or, or kind of reposition your, your messaging and your strategy. Um, I think all that goes into to the start, but just make sure that you guys aren't committing too much to anything because you're going to have to learn something at some point, which will probably throw off your initial assumptions. Yeah. And you know, uh, that, that's... Uh you've seen this now it's funny you say that but you've seen this now so so many times people want to i say eat their dessert first you know they want to do the fun things of the of the launching the business yeah. they're just not ready yet and then you know it's, it's hard it's easier to make logos and go have face-to-face -face conversations with people you don't know right exactly exactly yeah so um i do see um you know we don't have a whole heck of a lot of time but but, but we do have uh some questions about dividing ownership other uh questions about um you know, advice that you might be able to give for somebody who wants to go into business and, oh, they don't have an idea yet? Um, yeah, so that, that's actually a really good one. So I was that person. I, I, I really wanted to get into the Zon Center, right? And that was my goal. And I thought I had six months to come up with an idea. And yeah. that overwhelmed me because I'm not an idea guy. I'm, I'm passionate about things. And if I, if I really get passionate about something, like, I'll do whatever it takes to make that happen. Like, I've proven it time and time again. But I don't ever just have, like, where I'm sitting around and I'm like, oh, man, like, if the world had that, it would be a better place. And I know exactly how to get there. Now, Luke did. And that, that's when I, when I met Luke, that's another thing about these, these incubators and these startup centers. Um, Luke elevated, again, like my, my perspective on what was possible being a student, you know, uh, and, and, you know, outside of just what the ZIP program wanted me to do. And so Luke had an idea and Luke said, hey, I have an idea. And so sometimes you can become an entrepreneur like I did by just, finding an idea you really, really can get behind. And for me, he was doing ed tech and I had just got done trying to get through school doing chemotherapy with nothing but technology. So I had this newfound appreciation for students advancing and doing better by using technology, like, you know, um, smart, like in a smart way. And so I was all in on what he was doing just because I thought it'd be a great bullet point on my resume to say I was, you know, grand overlord of, of course key, you know, at some point or whatever I wanted to call myself. And I thought, you know, it'd be a great opportunity to actually, you know, see if we can improve some classes along the way or just learn a little bit more about that. Um, so early on, it was just me finding somebody who had an idea. And then again, bringing superpowers to the table where when Luke saw him, he was like, holy shit, like those are, those are, you know, qualities that I think we can use in the company. And if you guys, if somebody just mentioned they know Mark, you know, Mark brings the same superpowers I do. Like Mark's from the same place I'm from. Like we went to high school together. Um, and so, so once you start, you know, Get, getting to the point where, you know, if, if you find something that you really want to get behind and you really want to take a risk on it and you're willing to go all in, um, you'll start having conversations about equity before you even have to ask. Like I never asked Luke for equity until after he offered it to me and then we negotiated. But it's not like I said, I'm starting this only if I get equity. I was willing to put in the work to prove that my, my superpowers can contribute and then once he saw the impact and the, the, again, you, you get paid for value you bring to your business and the value your business brings to the market. You do not get paid for time. So I put in the time, but I got paid and, and I got equity for my value. Um, and so that was something where I learned from Luke, you know, he, he saw, he had a vision. He saw something that I didn't see. And when you get around somebody like that, they say iron sharpens iron. And so I started growing with them and I got to the point now where, you know, we've created this blueprint to where I feel like, of course, he did fail because of coronavirus our team could pick up tomorrow and start a new business, tackling a new problem. And we do much quicker and faster than we did today because we've got the blueprint versus just the, the well-built house. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and um, by the way, Ezra and anybody else who they don't have an idea, but they do want to 
uh, become an entrepreneur and they want to get into entrepreneurship, we have 20 teams going through the Rec Innovation Lab this semester. 20 teams that are already going through, they have an idea that is an amazing idea because we only let in 20 teams and we had 114 applications. Um, and so we know their ideas are amazing and we know that they have um, help from Ryan and from other mentors there and they're looking for uh, teammates right now. They're, they're desperate to, to find people who want to come in and, and work with them and just uh, to learn the process. So if that is you and you are interested in um, working in a startup, you'll get class credit for it. You don't know if you'll get equity, maybe someday down the line, but that's not um, what you do it for. You do it for the experience and some class credit. Uh, then definitely uh, send me uh, uh, an email. Let, let me know. I'll, I'll go ahead and share uh, my contact information here. And uh, you can also go on to our website. Um, so I, I think uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time here, but um, I would just love to say again, thank you, Ryan, so much for everything. And, and Ryan, is there anything else you want to share just at the very end? What you um, no, I, I do think what you just said is really important. I don't know if everybody caught that, but you don't get involved for entrepreneurs. There's a saying like, you know, you know, become a millionaire is great, but it's who you have to become in order to make the million that really counts. And that's the same with entrepreneurship. Like you don't get involved in a startup company for what you're going to get paid. Like that's not why you do it. You do it for who you're going to become. And I would even challenge you guys who are like, I'm going to go get a job instead. You don't take a job for pay. You take a job for who you get to become at the job. Otherwise you're just one of those high paid people that are miserable versus somebody who, you know, maybe you're making a little less money, but you're passionate and you're mastering your skills. Right. And so um, just really take that to heart. That last little comment she said about, you know, not starting it for equity, starting it for, for who you become along that process. Um, I really believe, you know, learning to enjoy, like when I went through chemotherapy, there is this sick kind of twisted, you know, appreciation I had for me going through that process. And I knew the end result was going to be, I'm going to live, but I didn't, you know, I, I wanted to just know that I'm the type of person who can beat this and go through that process because why not me? And a result of that, a byproduct of that was going to be that I'd be cancer free someday. Um, so just make sure that you guys are in it for the right reasons and, and um, just try, try not to, uh, to, to get too far ahead of expectation wise of um, where you're at, right? Just make sure you guys are self-assessing, reach out for help along the way if you guys have any questions and definitely keep tuning into things like this. I mean, you know, there's only a small percentage of people who even get involved, you know, in rec centers or come to webinars on a Monday when I'm sure Netflix has. I don't know what they just released, but I'm pretty sure it's good. Um, so thank you guys for, for spending the time with us tonight. And if anybody has any questions outside of this, again, you can find me on any of those platforms and, and feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm pretty responsive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you everyone for coming. I'll see most of you in classes. Have a great night and, uh, and take care. And I'll stick around if, if anybody has any questions for me. I'm going to stop the recording.